creation reveals to us your greatness, tells us that you are creator and that you are also creative. This morning we join our voices with the silent voices of the mountains, the hills, the seas, the atmosphere, in their own ways, giving glory, praise to you. Those of us with voices which you have blessed with consciousness, join with all your creatures, join with all your creation in giving praise to you this morning. The sun shoots its rays across the skies, giving us light, giving us warmth. The wind blows from one direction to another, giving us freshness, providing us with air so that we can live. The tide goes in and comes out. The wind blows through the plants, through the trees, giving them life. In the sea, we see the colors, the contrast. At night, we see the moon and the stars. During the day, we see the clouds hurry to and fro. All of these, in their own silent ways, they give you glory and praise. And therefore, it is just right for us, your people, created in your image, blessed with consciousness, to raise our voices together with your creation to offer you praise. We are thankful, Lord God, this morning for the life that you have given us, the breath, your spirit, which enlivens us, makes us alive. We say thank you, Lord God, for the needs that you have provided us with, for the food, the water, shelter, clothes that we have, for the fellowship and the friendship that we share with one another, with our families, with relatives and friends. We say thank you. There's so much that we take for granted, and yet, these are what you have given us. Thank you for knowledge so that we are able to know, to discover, to analyze, to ask questions. Thank you for the skills and the talents that we are blessed with so that we are able to work, work and able to earn a living for our families, for those whom we love. Thank you, Lord God, for the gift of your son. Thank you for coming down to our level. Thank you for sharing this human life with us. Thank you for allowing yourself to come and encounter the harsh realities of life, showing how much you care for us. Thank you for your spirit who lives in us, who gives us life, who energizes us every day, who helps us to think about issues and things. Thank you that your spirit walks with us. Your spirit is the paraclete, our companion on the way, leading us, guiding us, giving us strength each day. Thank you for the gift of people, of family members. Thank you for the love and fellowship and friendship that we share, the laughter that we can enjoy with each other. Even for those moments when sadness hits us, for those moments when things don't go right according to the way that we want them to go. Because during those moments, you walk with us. You journey with us. And for those, we also thank you. Thank you for this morning. Thank you for all your people who are gathered here. And thank you that as we go through this time of worship, 
that we are together and that you are with us. We pray, Lord God, and ask that you may forgive us for those words that we said which hurt others, for those acts that we did which were not helpful to other people, for the thoughts we had which were not wholesome. Forgive us, Lord God, for those times when we should have acted and we did not, for those times that we should have said something but we remain silent. Forgive us, Lord God, for those times that we have been complacent in the care of your good creation, for the times that we know when something is wrong and yet we don't say it, speak up. Forgive us for those times when your creation has been abused, your creation which nourishes us, which gives us life, without which there would be no more life on this earth. Forgive us for those moments and energize us with your spirit that we may continue to be on the lookout to do that which is right and good when the opportunities arise. These are our prayers, Lord God, our prayers of praise and thanksgiving, our prayers of co confession. We offer to you in and through the name of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Yesterday we celebrated, we commemorated Trinity Sunday. It is part of the church year calendar. So for this morning's reflection, I decided to pick two of the readings that were assigned for Trinity Sunday um, and taken from the Revised Common Lectionary. And uh, the two readings I have chosen uh, from the Old Testament and from the Epistle reading. So the Old Testament reading for Trinity Sunday comes from Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, and then verses 26 to the end, verse 30. Genesis chapter 1, verses 1 to 2, and then 26 up to verse 30. And I will be reading from the new revised standard version. In the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth, the earth was a formless void, and darkness covered the face of the deep, while a wind from God swept over the face of the waters. From 26. Then God said, Let us make humankind in our image, according to our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over the cattle and over all the wild animals of the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. So God created humankind in his image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the earth and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves upon the earth. God said, See, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is upon the face of all the earth and every tree with seed in its fruit, you shall have them for food. And to every beast of the earth, and to every bird of the air, and to everything that creeps on the earth, everything that has the breath of life, I have given every green plant for food. And it was so. <coughs> then from the New Testament, Paul's second letter to the Corinthians, chapter 13, 11 to 13. Second Corinthians, chapter 13, verses 11 to 13. <clears throat> Finally, 
brothers and sisters, farewell. Put things in order. Listen to my appeal. Agree with one another. Live in peace. And the God of love and peace will be with you. Greet one another with a holy kiss. All the saints greet you. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with all of you. This is the word of the Lord. As I mentioned yesterday, uh, throughout the church, not just here, but throughout the global church, we celebrated and we commemorated Trinity Sunday, which is the Sunday that comes after Pentecost. And from a theological point of view, Trinity is perhaps the most difficult doctrine or teaching of Christianity within Christianity to understand. And uh, this morning, I do not intend to grapple with this mystery of the Trinity, which is a very difficult one for us to try to understand. <laughs> in fact, the word Trinity is not found in the Bible. When we move from Genesis to the end, there is no word Trinity that we find in the Bible. Instead, what we have are texts <laughs> spread throughout the scripture, especially found in the New Testament, where God, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit are mentioned together or mentioned side by side. An example of this is from the second reading that we read together this morning, Paul's second letter to the Corinthians, and we have other places in the New Testament where these three are mentioned together side by side. This morning I would actually like to speak on a theme which for me sums up the meaning of Trinity, especially for our day and for our age. <clears throat> and so the theme which I would like to reflect on very briefly is Trinity is God in community and in relation. Trinity is God in community and in relation. We have two prominent Pacific theologians who pioneered the theology of God as community. These are Reverend Leslie Bosetto of the United Church in Solomon Islands, which many of you would know, I think. And then the second one is Fiji's own Reverend Dr. Sevati Tuvere of the Methodist Church here in Fiji. What is interesting with these two pioneer theologians is that when they talk about community, they mean not just a human community. Their understanding of community goes beyond human community. And they have in mind community that is inclusive, that includes human beings, but also includes other beings in the environment, in the earth. Sevati's uh, Tuvere's theology of the Vanua makes that very, very clear. So it's more a biotic and inclusive community that they talk about, not just human beings. And for me, this is actually one of the greatest thinking that <clears throat> we have amongst our theologians in the Pacific. And therefore, the environment is taking central place in many levels of discussion, ecology, environment, levels of discussions and meetings. Just last week, we all know, we are aware, because Fiji was represented there. The Fiji Prime Minister uh, made a presentation along with other NGOs here in Fiji, Piango, for example. The OSENS conference, which was hosted by the United Nations. And even here in our own, on our place, Reverend James Bagwan, who's here this morning, he was involved in marking the World Ocean's Day on Thursday last week, the 8th of June, through a paddler's cleanup campaign along the Suva foreshore. And then on Saturday, the PTC community organized a similar activity of cleaning up the Suva fall, uh, uh, shoreline. Community and relationship are the inwards 
in current ecological environmental discussions and discussions about creation, God's creation. All creatures of God constitute or make up a community in relationship. And this truth is central to the text that we read this morning from Genesis chapter 1. In fact, Genesis chapters 1 and 2, we read about this community in relationship. I would like to highlight the following insights from Genesis chapter 1, but also uh, including <coughs> Genesis chapter 2. Firstly, the God who is presented in Genesis chapter 1 and chapter 2 is not a God who dwells in isolation. Is not a God who lives in isolation. This is a God who lives, who works within community, who works and lives within relationships. God's approach to creation is communal. It is relational. And in the wake of God's initiating activity or creation that we read about this morning, God works from within the world rather than work on the world from outside. That is very clear in the text. In chapter 1, we also see the spirit or the wind, the ruach, the breath already moving across the face of the waters, working with God in willing creation or in the process of creation. Secondly, we also see in the text, and uh, this is very clear again in Genesis chapter 2, that God uses already existing matter in creating. The images of Genesis chapters 1 and 2 bring three dynamic aspects together. One, God. Secondly, raw material. And thirdly, movement or work. All of this. And together, signal a dynamic process of creation, not, not a static one, but it is dynamic. It is full of activity, full of life, an open process rather than one that is tightly controlled. For example, in Genesis 2, God assumes human form and shapes the ground into a human being. We see God here getting dirt under his fingernails, under God's fingernails, according to verse 7 of chapter 2. Human beings, according to this text, are created out of already existent material, already existent creature, namely <coughs> earth or ground, or in Hebrew, Adama. Thirdly, God calls upon already existing material creatures to bring about new creations. Perhaps this is something that we have not noticed before. But if we read the text very carefully, we see God calling upon existing creatures to bring about new creations. For example, in Genesis chapter 1, verses 11 to 13, if we read that carefully, God invites, says, let the earth bring forth. Let the earth bring forth. Okay, and we are told in those verses that the earth brought forth. So what we have here, according to this text, the earth was already in existence and is the subject of bringing forth, generating, creating other creatures. We see that happening. The non-human creatures in these stories, they have a vocational genuine role in the continuing of creation or in, a, in, a, in enabling creation to become. And we see the same with the sea. Let the sea bring forth. We see the sea, we see the earth, the life generating capacity that is in there bringing forth other creatures. So what we see here is the contribution of these non-human creatures in the process of creation. That story of creation has been repeated over the millennia. And as we see new creatures coming into being, being brought into existence by existing creatures, we see this from glaciers to volcanoes to tropical cyclones, and all of that happens to tsunamis. So in these words, let the earth bring forth, we also see a divine self-limitation. That is, God limits God's self and lets the world create itself with freedom. 
we talk about the discoveries of sciences, new plants, new species coming out. It is as if God stands back enabling the creatures to be and to become who they were created to be. Unfortunately, in many ways, and we know this very well, that human beings have abused this creative possibility. Human beings have abused this creative freedom to the dangers, to the harm of both ourselves and the rest of other creatures. Fourthly, God invites the divine counsel to participate in the creation of the human being. Let us. God's involvement in creative activity with creatures who are not God is seen in this text, particularly in verse 26. Our image, our likeness. Now, because of um, Trinity Sunday that we have celebrated, many people have also interpreted this plural, let us, our image, our likeness. It has been explained in terms of the Trinity from the beginning of creation. At the same time, I would also like to point out that most scholars understand it in terms of the divine counsel, the heavenly assembly that does God's bidding, that obeys the word of God. This implies that social and relational human beings, when we relate to people, we are correspondent to the God who relates to others. So to be social, to be communal, to be relational is at the heart of what it means to be created in the image of God. This is an integral part of how we in our, in our part of the world in the Pacific live. We notice here that God creates communally. The creation of the human community is the result of a dialogue within the heavenly council rather than individual act by God alone. We see this very clearly. Genuine interaction and interdependence or what um, Archbishop of the Church of um, Anglican Diocese of Polynesia calls the interconnectedness, interrelationships. They are very much characteristics of God's creative activity. Fifth, we see in the text that God is both creator and very creative being. It follows that part of what it means to be created in the image of God is that human beings are also creative beings. You and I, we are creative beings because we are created in the image of a creative God. According to the text, God is imaged as one who chooses to share power in relationship in the work of creating. And this is a very important insight. God chooses to share power in the, in the relationship of creating. So this means that the way in which humans as image of God exercises dominion is to be shaped by that model of power sharing. God said, let us. In the home, in the family, in the church, in the community, to share power is to reflect God's model of power sharing in the work of creating and in the work of allowing creation to become. When we share power, we open the future possibilities to our families. When we share power, we open the future possibilities for the church, for the community, and for our nations at large. <clears throat> so that all of these become, can become what God intends them to be. Power sharing is create to, to be created in the image of God. God's creation is built to go somewhere, and the potential of becoming is built into the very structure of the world, including us human beings. God creates a dynamic world in which the future is open to a number of possibilities. And as creatures in God's image, what we choose to do or what we choose not to do is crucial for proper development, for proper care of this earth. In pursuing these tasks, human beings cannot rest back and assume that God will take care of everything or that the future of creation is solely, only in the hands of God. 
We are co-creators with God. We have been given that task. Human beings are called not to be passive in relation to the earth. Rather, we are called to a genuine, we are called to a proactive and active engagement because the nature of our engagement will have significant implications for the future of the environment, for the future of the world in which we live, which is our home. The Genesis story presents a God who is both creator and creative, and a God who is communal, a God who is relational. Genesis 1 reveals a God who engages with all creatures and who lets creatures bring forth creation to continue with that creation. Humans and non-humans, we are together a community in which God is the integral partner and member. And we see this in the book of Psalms, Psalms 104, particularly verses 29 and 30. This psalm highlights that all of God's creatures, humans and non-humans, are given life by the same spirit. When such truth is fully understood by the human component of creation, it has the potential to shape, to transform how we relate in the world, how we live in the world, and how we care for the environments around us. <clears throat> this vision of a relational and communal God is embodied in the theological term of the Trinity, who we remembered yesterday. It is immortalized in the blessing or benediction which we recite several times in a week during worship and prayer times. And this is what we find in the epistle reading. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. We say this benediction or blessing every time. Grace, love, and fellowship. Words that highlight the centrality, words that highlight the significance of community, the significance of relationships. These are all rooted in God. So whenever we recite these words, what we are doing is actually we are wishing for the fullness of God to be present. We are wishing for the fullness of God to be experienced among, amongst us amongst God's own people. So I would ask us, whenever we say this, let us not take it lightly, for it is a very serious prayer. There is one more point which I would like to close with this morning. That is that every time we say the words, the communion or fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you, let us remember always that this fellowship of the Holy Spirit, this communion of the Holy Spirit goes beyond communion, goes beyond fellowship between human beings. We go back to Tuvere, we go back to Bosetto for these original ideas. It includes our communion with the rest of God's creation. The spirit which gives humans life is the spirit which gives life to other living creatures as well. All life comes from God through the Spirit of God. As the world-renowned theologian Eugen Moltmann says, and I quote, I close with this quote from Moltmann. He says, Experience of the life-giving spirit in the faith of the heart and in the sociality of love leads of itself beyond the limits of the church to the rediscovery of the same spirit in nature in plants, in animals, and in the ecosystems of the earth. To experience the fellowship of the Spirit inevitably carries Christianity beyond itself into the greater fellowship of all God's creatures. For the community of creation in which all created things exist with one another, for one another, and in one another is also the fellowship of the Holy Spirit." Unquote. Through the Trinity, we are connected to the earth. Through the Trinity, we are connected to the environment. Through the Trinity, we are connected to the ecosystems of the earth. Through the Trinity, 
we are connected to creation itself. Let us cherish and act on this belief. Let us cherish and act on this truth. When I was young, one I know I used to go to my grandparents to spend weekends or holidays. And one time I noticed um, when I went, my grandparents, they were very good farmers. They had gardens, food gardens everywhere. And outside their, their house, there were all these fruit trees, many of them, all kinds of fruit trees. And as a result, there were too many mosquitoes around the place because of the trees that were there. And I, one time I, I said to my grandfather, hey, there are so many mosquitoes. Why is it that you continue to, to keep all these trees around the place? Why don't you cut them down? And then my grandfather turned to me and said, you know why? Because these trees and us breathe into each other. We breathe into each other. I never understood until I went to high school, and he never went to high school. He was a simple farmer. But he told me, we breathe into each other. We breathe into the trees, the trees breathe into us. Through the Trinity, we are connected to the environment. Through the Trinity, we are connected to God's very good creation. And that is the reason why, as churches, we take care of creation that God has blessed us with. And that is why we must support the work that continues to go on in ensuring that the environment, God's creation, is cared for because we breathe into each other. In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.